Uh, I'm Tom Goldstein. I'm the publisher of Scotus Log. I'm a Washington lawyer. I have a law firm called Goldstein and Russell. Uh, I teach Supreme Court litigation at Stanford and Harvard Law Schools. Uh, there are two principal pieces to the NFIB versus Sibelius decision. One is about the individual mandate, and one is about the expansion of Medicaid. And on the individual mandate, which is the requirement that by 2014 most Americans have health insurance, the Supreme Court upheld that provision, even though the provision was always kind of misunderstood. The provision, as it was enacted by Congress, was never truly a mandate in the sense that by not buying health insurance, you would be breaking the law. Instead, the provision always said you will uh, have health insurance or, and if, this is if you're a covered person, uh, you're gonna, if you don't, then you're going to have to pay a tax. And what the Supreme Court said is that structure, which is a, essentially a tax for failing to do something, is constitutional. They said that five to four. Uh, with the four members of the courts uh, left, uh, joined by Chief Justice Roberts, who wrote the opinion. The court, by another 5-4 majority, Chief Justice Roberts and the court's more conservative members, uh, held that the individual mandate couldn't be sustained as a regulation of interstate commerce, which is Congress's principal regulatory authority and power under the Constitution, uh, they concluded that the Constitution, when it allows Congress to regulate commerce, doesn't allow Congress to require the creation of commerce. And that was, was what would be required by an individual mandate, and that is you would be required to buy health insurance. They weren't regulating the health insurance you were purchasing. Uh, but the bottom line was that this structure of buy health insurance or pay a tax was upheld. So that's the first piece of the Supreme Court's decision. There isn't a big practical difference that comes from the fact that the court upheld the individual mandate provision under the taxing power and refused to uphold it under the commerce power. It seems odd that you know it would not be authorized under one provision of the Constitution, but it would be under another. The reason is that the Supreme Court wasn't looking at this as a question of, did it violate individual rights? So we have a Fourth Amendment that protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, for example. And no matter what power Congress might use to enact a law, whether under the commerce power or the taxing power, if it violates individual rights, then it's invalid. What was going on here was that the government was looking for some basis to justify the adoption of the law. And so the Supreme Court looked at one basis, the principal one, the principal one that was offered, the Commerce Clause, and said that doesn't work. You can't create commerce under that constitutional power of Congress's. But the court said, yes, under the taxing power, Congress has an almost plenary authority. It can tax basically almost no matter what it wants to do. It can't adopt penalties under the taxing power, but it can adopt taxes, and it can adopt taxes that are intended to influence personal behavior. And here they've adopted a tax that's intended to influence you to buy health care. And it's kind of an argument that only lawyers could love, and that is that this one box doesn't work, but the lawyers found another box uh, under which it could be sustained. So the upshot is that the individual mandate survives. Now, there is one practical consequence to rejecting one theory of the Commerce Clause and accepting another the taxing power, and that it really focuses people for the first time on this fact that you can refuse to buy the health insurance. And particularly in the early years, the tax is not very much. It's only you know sixty dollars for for most people right out of the box, I think. Uh, and then it focuses people on another provision that says that if you refuse even to pay the tax, you can't go to jail for tax evasion. Uh, the IRS can garnish a uh, tax rebate of yours. They can make harassing phone calls. But the government's ability to enforce the tax is actually very limited. And so 
it is possible that there will be people, you know, supporters of the Tea Party, for example, who will, as a matter of principle, just refuse to pay the tax, excuse me, will, will refuse to buy the health insurance and may even refuse to pay the tax. Um, so there's also the second part of the case, which is really uh, not one that people expected there to be much action in, and it turns out there was. This is the very significant expansion of Medicaid eligibility under the Affordable Care Act, and Congress provided that most of the costs, initially all of the costs, uh, for the expansion of the Medicaid rules would be paid for by the federal government. But Congress had said to the states, well, you don't have to take this Medicaid money, but if you decide not to, then we can take away not just this Medicaid money, but all your Medicaid money. And the Supreme Court really for the first time, and it did this in the Sibelius case by a 72 majority, said that's too much extortion to try and make the states change their Medicaid eligibility that much under the threat of losing all of their Medicaid money. And so this has to be interpreted as essentially an option, that the states have the ability to make a decision about this pool of money without endangering all of the money. And uh, what that means is probably not a huge amount. There may be some states like Texas uh, that have very conservative governors that may decide to turn down the new money as a matter of principle and not expand their Medicaid rolls. But almost every state, they're just not going to turn down billions of dollars to provide health care to their citizenry. Uh, so there, there are going to be some states perhaps that will not take uh, the new Medicaid funding, the big impact of that decision is probably going to be felt in other areas of the law because Congress does this all the time. It pulls back on the purse strings. It offers you it, uh, money, but it makes it contingent on doing all kinds of things. The classic example really is highway funding. If you don't make your drinking age this, if you don't make your maximum speed limit that, there are numerous provisions in the U.S. Code where Congress threatens the states with yanking money out from uh, underneath them if they don't comply with congressional directives. And you can probably expect to see a lot more lawsuits about that. So there have been all kinds of rumors uh, and allegations and supposed leaks from the court about what happened in the voting in the health care case focused almost entirely on the idea that the Chief Justice had voted to invalidate the mandate and changed his mind, and the claim that he did so out of fear for the court's reputation. At the threshold, you have to be incredibly doubtful about the accuracy of this. The, these are all completely unsourced things from people who have agendas, uh, who are trying to spin things in their own favor, and when the court, again, is just not in a position to respond because it never comments on things like this. Uh, if you were to ask me kind of what I bet happened here is I expect you can tell a little bit from the opinion assignments. And so we know that the Chief Justice almost certainly had the majority from the very beginning. Uh, and my guess is that he, coming out of the box, out of the oral argument, was confident that he didn't think the statute could be upheld under the Commerce Clause he was competent in the Medicaid ruling, uh, and he was struggling with what to do about the taxing authority. And that both the left and the right thought that they had a very good chance of him coming down on their side. And he eventually resolved that in favor of uh, upholding the statute in the course of the writing process. And that conservatives inside the court were apoplectic about that. And uh, they have spun it as the chief not doing that in a kind of judicial capacity, but in a political capacity of trying to protect the court's reputation. Now, that doesn't really make a lot of sense in the, in the sense that it's not the Affordable Care Act wasn't the world's most popular statute. Uh, it wasn't that Americans were clamoring for it to be upheld. And so it seems very unlikely. I think that it's the, the chief is certainly aware of the consequence of the decision uh, in terms of it, it, I think, builds the court's reputation as a nonpartisan institution. But I, I don't think that 
that would have driven his decision. I think he's an incredibly serious guy, has that reputation. Uh, and I think that it really, the whole set of rumors really reflects very poorly on those who have participated in the leaks. Uh, and, you know, prob- it wouldn't be surprising if they diminished themselves in his eyes and the eyes of others uh, because it's so irresponsible and it's kind of a wild accusation. It seems like that the leaking of that claim started a couple of months before the decision itself where someone or some people were trying to put word out that the chief was wobbly and that he might vote to uphold it for uh, reasons of the court's reputation. And so that there was a, by at least one person, a real concerted effort to kind of pressure him internally and externally, which is very, very unfortunate and unseemly. I do think that the it's conservatives who are upset, some subset of conservatives who are upset with the chief for the moment, but that's going to pass, I think, very quickly. He is a very solidly conservative justice, if you just look at the pattern of his votes and the time there, and uh, he will, nothing is fundamentally different about that, and kind of folks on the left, liberals, progressives, who are excited about his decision are going to fall out of love with him just as quickly as they've fallen in love with him, uh, because he is who he is. Um, And uh, I think that, you know, one one consequence of this, hopefully, was that there'll be less leaking, but conceivably a consequence of it will be that there's more because this happened. No one seems to have been burned by it. uh, And, you know, know, a, a new culture could emerge of, uh, trying to influence the court uh, from, you know, leaks from within, which would, I think, be very unfortunate. Maybe. Right, so you can look at the decision in the fashion of saying, we're going to finally put some brakes on Congress's commerce power. Uh, which has really been the principal tool it's used for the expansion of the entire regulatory state. Um, And we're not going to completely hobble Congress because it can do things through taxation, but it's going to be held really accountable for doing that because there's such resistance to things labeled taxes. And so you could, Marbury versus Madison is a very similar situation where by kind of using, varying one power and disclaiming another, actually the court produced uh, a a very particular outcome, a a much more subtle, sophisticated uh, way without uh, seeming to claim a lot of power for itself. The Supreme Court ended up with judicial review. Um, The difficulty with that reading of this decision, I think, is that the limitation on the commerce power that's articulated in the decision is not really a very significant one. Uh, The whole point of the plaintiffs, the states, the National Federation of Independent Businesses is that Congress had never done this before. It had never ordered the creation of commerce. And there really isn't any reason to expect that Congress was on the brink of doing that in other contexts. When the economy really cratered, they didn't order people to buy cars, Uh, It was a very unusual provision. Now, if the court's Commerce Clause holding pretends a rebirth in a line of cases that says we're serious about, for the first time in a century, paying attention to limits on the commerce power, if this isn't the first of many decisions, well, then it will be very meaningful. When... Chief Justice Rehnquist passed away and Sandra Day O'Connor left the court. The principal movers behind recognizing limits on federal power kind of left the court. And we haven't really seen previous indications that their replacements in Chief Justice Roberts and Sam Alito really were going to rework the law in this area and rebalance power between the states and the federal government in limiting the Commerce Clause. 
But if that's not true, if they are now quite serious about that, then that will be the lasting legacy of this decision together with the limitation on Congress's spending power, the ability to yank back the Medicaid money and what that will mean in other contexts. But for the moment, the Commerce Clause decision really is a one-off. And I don't read it as more than a one-off because it's not part of a larger body of decisions over the past five years where a majority of the Supreme Court has said, we are serious, Congress, you're going too far, you're trying to do too much under this Commerce Clause power, we're going to put the brakes on you.